Time's up. Admiral. Here it comes. Chevron one, loaded. For my ally is the force. And the power for ally it is. Life creates it. Makes it grow. You failed your eyes. I am a Jedi. Like my father before me. Cry havoc! And let's set the dogs of war. Give to it, Peter. Hold on. What is best in life? Crush your enemies. See them driven before you. They hear the lamentation of your women. It's all in the reflexes. But I'll also say that you're heavy into martial arts, Tai Chi, and all that, uh, killer stuff. I suppose we have to register you as a lethal weapon. Chevron 3 encoded. And somebody ought to belt you in the mouth. But I won't. I won't. The hell I will. Chevron 4 encoded. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Chevron 5 encoded. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to be. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Devon Sixty Coded. Back while you can, Monk Boy. I had scum. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. You shall not pass! I thought I'd die fighting side by side with an owl. What about side by side with a friend? A day may come when the courage of men fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship. But it is not this day. Everyone seven is locked. Hail and howdy, everybody. Welcome back to another set of night driving where my internet fixed itself and I'm back on camera. I am shut up. God, you gotta ruin my fun, don't you? It's gonna gotta ruin my feeling good. I can stream again normally. Oh, break again. Uh Anyway, hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I hope everybody's having a good Saturday evening. And we're, I think we're gonna have some fun today. And I, I, as always, Jed, how are you? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm excited to talk about this movie, mainly because Adam continues his long-standing tradition of picking movies that just don't hold up. I'm just embarrassed. Oh, damn it. Samuel was right. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I just oh, needed I to you. see you sweat for a I second. Hate you. I hate you. I hate you so much. God damn it. I- I did. I did enjoy this film. It was my oh, first thank watch, God. Film, but uh, I, I do have uh, some criticisms, of course. But <laughs> so I'm there are excited criticisms. To talk about them. Mm-hmm. There are criticisms. To be to sure. There are criticisms. To be sure. Listen, I have. And I, I will tell my story. I've been watching this movie forever. I there are little things throughout it that always get me. It's tiny little things, and but oh, I'm just. I'm just glad you liked it. I didn't. You guys got to understand. I know you'd said that. You you it, said you uh, were worried about me liking I'm it. So always I worried. I always that. worry. I do not have a good track record with you for the past year. Right now, <laughs> past year there have been there have been very big misses between what I what I love from my from my childhood and all this stuff, and you go, eh. Eh. or Ugh. so I I I. I, I want you to like this shit so much. Anyway, I'm glad, glad it's going to be one of those ones. <laughs> anyway, and we are joined once again by our good friend, green-haired Antonio. Gal, getting ready for Vegas. Are you excited? Yes, yes, I am. I realized that uh, I had muted my physical mic for a moment to say mm-hmm. something uh, to someone earlier. And I I had said, I was like, you're trolling. There's no way <laughs> you said that. And I'm like, oh, my God, he didn't even hear me. <laughs> See, uh, <laughs> I'm just trolling. He has to be. I'm I'm too susceptible at this point because I'm always yeah. expecting he's gonna be disappointed in me and oh, my believe, choices. I was expecting the same thing, like just because I want him to like it so much. But then I was just like, there's no way he can't like this movie. It holds up. There's no I know. Way. I mean, uh so as you guys can see tonight, we are here to talk the fifth element. Hail and howdy to everybody across both chats. Hit the like buttons, subscribe to the channels, links in the description below, and let's get started because I want to talk about this. Now, I think I'm the only person who was there 
when it released in the theater? Did everybody, anyone besides me see it in theater for the first time? I don't remember if I saw it in theater. Okay. When did it come out? 92? Oh, I would have say. Pretty. I want to say 92. Jed, do we have... Yeah. Do, uh, I, I can look it up. Yeah, look it up no, I, I didn't watch it in theaters. That's well, of course you didn't. You're a child. Um, Wait, are I you did, uh, 97. 97. Uh, okay, so I'm a little older. Okay, I'm a little oh, older. Okay. I still wasn't oh, born yet. Yeah, okay, so... Did you, did you just say you still weren't born yet? Yes, he's a child. He's a, he's a child uh, like Dermot, hey, but he's I, not Dermot. I, I did live in the 90s for about 30 days. That's like me <laughs> saying that I lived in the 80s no, for uh, three uh, months. I was born at the very tail end of 99. Oh, yeah, it's... Listen, listen, at least he's better than Dermy, okay? At least he's better than Dermy, all right? Wait, was Dur um, Dermy out of the 90s? No, he, no, no, he's he older than me. He's a little he's a little older, but I mean, <laughs> it's still Dermy. At least, listen, Jed has an old soul. That's why, that's yes. why we like him. <laughs> and, and, that, and that's, why, that's why I forgive him for being a child. Anyway, I was there, though, in 97. It's possible, uh, I did. And here's the thing. When this movie first came out, its marketing was zero. Nobody knew what this movie was. All we saw was a couple of strange posters. It wasn't even the poster that you're familiar with uh, later on where you see Bruce Willis, you see Gary Oldman, you see Mila on the cover. It was just this picture, the fifth element, and a weird thing. At least that's what I remember in my theaters locally. And we went in there having no idea what this was going to be. We just did. We think it's a science fiction movie. That's back in the day where we went and showed up and we just watched the movie what was there we didn't mm -hmm. we we didn't need the marketing it was like okay i this movie just came out let's go check it out and we went in there my friends and i and everybody that everybody at that time no idea and we were all blown away by what did we just see this thing is wow it's crazy sci-fi it's a little off the wall uh the performances were just spot on we didn't know it was a bruce willis movie i didn't know it was a bruce willis movie going in had no idea. And Gary Oldman comes out of nowhere to choose scenery and be an, what I consider, I consider Zorg an underrated villain. People don't give him enough love for just how pure evil mm -hmm. he is. And, and it's, we'll get into it. So I, when it came out, it was great. And then I fell in love. It was what I think it was the third DVD I ever bought when I started switching to DVD collecting. I mean, I had my VHS stuff, but it was like the third one. My first one I remember was uh, Mummy Returns, then uh, um, then American Pie 2, and then I think this was the third one I bought. Pretty sure. That is just a weird list of right? DVDs. I was That's just random. <laughs> well, I, w I was just, I wasn't really, I was transitioning away from VHS at the time. So you I just had what you saw? Basically. Yeah, and, and I wasn't really knowing a purchase, and I just, my first DVD player was my PS2, so I just had this thing, I wasn't sure, and I was like, oh, I just saw this movie, I liked it, let's get that, it was kind of spontaneous buying at that point, I wasn't really thinking about collecting, but it was, and I loved everything, I had a weird one, I had my original DVD, which I don't have anymore, because I just upgraded it to Blu-ray, finally, mm -hmm. it was a double-sided, one side was full screen, 4.3, the other side was widescreen, 16.9, and every so time it... Cool. Every time I had to watch it, that one, it was always, okay, check the side. Don't want to put the wrong one in because the wrong one is 4-3. You don't want to watch full screen. And oh, so you're a... not a Zack Snyder? No, boy. Zack Snyder, no. <laughs> you know what I just remembered today? I have to watch goddamn Rebel Moon Part 2 in a week. Why? That sucks to be you, nerd. Because I did the first part. I have to do the uh, did you? part. Yeah. But did you hear what he said about Rebel yes, Moon Yes, I did part hear that. Two? I did hear that. That'll be we'll great talk, We'll talk about that tomorrow. We'll talk about that tomorrow. That's 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 a, that's, that's a moment mm -hmm. of chuckle for tomorrow. Uh, uh, round table. He might actually be good at his job then. Well, hey, he likes certain types of close-ups. Anyway, um, he does. God. And slow mo. <laughs> no, it's like super slow mo. Are you super kidding? Slow. Hey, I made fun of that so hard in the first. Hey, it'll moment. work in his new movie. career. It'll work yes. in his new career. If I can, yes. so I watch all my videos because I have a lot of people I watch on YouTube at on one point seven five speed. Even Disparu. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I watched a video that Disparu was talking about Rebel Moon, like the trailer, his reaction to mm -hmm. part two, and he showed the slow mo parts, and they were slow. In for one point seven five speed, like that, it. I thought I was watching I, slow mo. I called Rebel Moon Part One slow motion the movie. That's it's in my so review. Crazy. That's what I called it. Anyway, but that's a discussion for another. Yeah, time. We're, sorry. Talking, we're talking about a good movie. That's my fault. I got us off tangent there. Uh, but yeah, so this was 
out of nowhere, and it, it is latched onto my heart. It's latched onto many. This is one of those movies that you either love it or you hate it. It's one of those. And it became a cult classic. I don't think it was profitable back in the day. And but it it found its niche later. And even uh, I have another story. Uh, well, I'll talk about that at the end. We talk about the soundtrack. I have a soundtrack story, but uh, I loved it. And I can never it, it's a, it's a happy place movie for me because and Jed, can you agree? It's while it is definitely science fiction, it's got that little bit of fantasy in there. Right. Would you say that? Well, mainly because of the, it, it doesn't take itself seriously, and no. it, and there, there's a lot of aspects to it that I would agree with that, especially with the prophecy, the more loose terms of sci-fi. Like it is not hard sci-fi. Like they don't even no. understand how decompression works in a hangar bay in a spaceship, <laughs> and that's the type of stuff I notice. So yeah, it is very much not hard sci-fi, and it's okay. It's what it's going for, and this yeah. is at least story style. It's very traditional in a lot of fantasy settings. Mm -hmm. You know the the hero who comes up uh, an ancient long forgotten evil and stuff like that religious figures like i would 100 percent agree this is a fantasy film in a sci-fi setting mm -hmm. i would agree with yeah that. yeah so so gal uh when you first saw this what was your reaction when you first saw this movie i was so young i i don't think i saw it in the theater so i was mm -hmm. eight seven or eight um and i just remember like sitting with my family after dinner type of thing in the living room, watching the movie and just loving it. Like our, our dad loved the movie. Our mom loved the movie. It's such a great movie. And that's those, those are like the great memories of just um, rewatching it with the family watching. I like, I don't remember the first time watching it. Mm -hmm. I have a really crap memory though, which is why. <laughs> um, and that that's just it's always just a fuzzy memory in the back of my head that oh let's put let's put the fifth element on because that's what was on the tv or vhs pop pop that in because we recorded it from the tv on our vhs type of thing and it's just always been in my life i rewatch it multiple mm -hmm. times throughout the year it's I love this movie so much. And I was so happy when I got to cosplay Lilu. Yes. <laughs> I wish I could have found my multi-pass. I don't uh, know where it is. <laughs> Lilu Dallas multi-pass. <laughs> that, that is the line that every time, there's two lines that everybody says when you, this movie comes up. First, Lilu Dallas multi-pass, and then Bada Big Boom. That, mm -hmm. that, that, those are the two lines that everybody does immediately. Now, I have plenty of favorite lines in this movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, and moments. And, and as far as, you know, quality goes, Alyssa, I live with someone who is essentially very high culture, my mother. And all my life, whenever this movie comes out, she listens to it. And she gives this movie the highest praise when it comes to the diva and the opposite because she isn't she, – she's into classical. She has a very perfect ear for opera, and she says that, they, that that scene nails it, that that is a perfectly done musical scene. She loves it every time, and – it's it, that scene we'll get when we talk about it. It you don't expect it. You don't expect that moment, and that is why uh, we're, we we save the soundtrack talk usually for the end of the show. But I will say it now: this is a movie that is heavily interwoven with its soundtrack. That these scene, a lot of these scenes are made classic because of those soundtracks, or they are definitely enhanced by it. Either way, all right. So let's get started. Ah, uh, fifth element, as Jed uh, mentioned when I was mentioned the famous part, it starts with a prophecy essentially. Every five thousand years, evil just appears in the universe. It appears, and some ancient, undisclosed peoples, not necessarily the Manda one, they're just the care one of the caretakers, I believe. I, I would look at this. Uh, they set up a a, a weapon. To stop evil. They, they literally created the weapon to stop evil. They took the, the four elements of the universe, earth, wind, and fire, and then made a fifth element, which essentially, I would say, heart, Captain Planet. Um, I think life makes more sense. Life, heart. I just want to take the heart joke. I want to take the heart joke. Um, and uh, use it to create the light of creation to banish evil every 5,000 years. Not defeat it, just banish it, send it back to clearly the other dimension it comes from. And we start our story in 1914 Egypt, the beginning of World War One. War is coming. The Monarchy will come. We get a nice little get Luke Perry cameo, R.I.P. Luke Perry. And it's an interesting way to start it, where it's just it, it, it's giving us the lore dump 
while entertaining us in a nice little prologue, I feel. I mean, I mean, Jed, were you interested right away in this moment? I I was confused more so because uh, similar to how you described it going into the theater, I knew nothing about this film. Mm-hmm. Of course, I'd heard the classic lines and seen yeah. the scene where Lila U jumps off the building. I didn't know there was any space travel in this movie. I didn't know there was mm-hmm. prophecy. I, I knew absolutely nothing. So I... I was just trying to figure it out in that moment. Mm-hmm. But it, for the prologue itself, it is fascinating. It feels like the opening of a, a, a lot of other films throughout the entire beginning. I was thinking a lot about The Mummy, the, mm-hmm. the original Brendan Fraser Mummy. That was the film that it was uh, hearkening back towards the most for me. But it was a neat little story trying to figure out who the good guys were or not. The priest trying to you know poison them. So you mm-hmm. assume he's the bad guy. And then later it's revealed that maybe he's not so bad. And it's a nice little story with humor that I've heard people quote, like the Aziz light portion. Yeah, I, I do have to say the alien design is bonkers. They, oh, they went, they, what aliens it, you saw, they just went with Monta they are, but they are not it, anything classified, but it's good practical effects though. Yeah. They're very good practical effects. And when, when it comes to a lot of this stuff, in the movie, like the alien design, really the uh, production design in general, it doesn't necessarily work for me. It's a little too over the I'm not going to mm-hmm. account it into my uh, mm-hmm. critique because it's very, very much a me thing. But uh, a lot of the campiness in the designs, if nothing else, sometimes in the performances like Gary Oldman is just too oh. much for me. Oh. So I can't enjoy as much as other people. But I realize that is very subjective. So I can't incorporate yeah. uh, subjective to that degree into my review but, but you said it yeah. perfectly before the movie knows what it's doing mm-hmm. it's absolutely Luke, that, Luke that's Besson, why i can't luke Besson leaned into it hard mm-hmm. we are going to make this we are going to give you a future 300 years in, in the 2200s or 2300 yeah 22 22 23 19 oh well, yeah 2200s in the 2200s we're gonna we're gonna give you a crazy looking world and we're gonna give you seated little bits of the world building. We're never going to fully world build for you. I'm going to give you a little bit, but when it comes to the visuals, we're just going to go with that. People are going to look plastic. Their clothes <laughs> are going to look plastic. They're going to have weird ass hats. Uh, and they're going to, the, the design of everything is just going to be, I would say, what's it, what's the word? Um, kind of 60s pop a little bit. How they would look at the future. You think about it. Everything is kind of broad over the top over over accentuated when it comes to this i mean you just have to look at the the radio host to realize things are over the top in this movie i think that is probably the best thing they predicted about the future because i can 100 percent see him being popular in today's world ruby rod would be and uh, ruby rod is just he's an amazing chris this is like this is one of the two movies that put chris tucker into Start him the time this and Friday, yeah. which hit him and um him and Mr. Lister. I always call him Zeus from from the Holds Bard. They were of course were in Friday together. So it's a lot of people who had been in other movies together are actually in this movie at the same time with each other. Which I that's just a little cinema thing I enjoy. But this was a movie that put this and Friday put Chris Tucker into position where he did Rush Hour with Jackie Chan. So that made him popular for a while. But he just he he they get yeah. over the top Ruby Rod and totally effeminate. But a poon hound. Yes, it's so Total good. poon hound, and it's good. <laughs> but so we get this thing, and Jed, let me ask you this, and then Gal, I'll go to you. Uh, how do you? I like the editing in this movie a lot. The cuts, the way they do it, the sharp cuts from one period to another, and one moment to another. I really like it. I find, even though sometimes they're sharp, I find them fluid, and it gets cleanly from one scene to another. You wouldn't think it, but I like it. How did you feel about that? They do a lot of quick jump cuts. It's kind of one of those uh, middle good type editings for this film because I didn't notice the editing. That's mm-hmm. I, I usually consider not noticing mm-hmm. editing as a positive thing. Okay. There are editings that I notice that are like, oh my God, that was incredible. And that's, of course, in the higher mm-hmm. tier. But this isn't a very good tier where I didn't notice the editing whatsoever. Mm-hmm. So I put it in the film's favor. Okay, they said, that's one of the things. See, I've seen it so many times. Today, I was trying to look at things from a different aspect. And talk about the editing. I was okay, so that that's good. That's good because usually when editing is bad, you jump on it immediately. Oh, yeah. but there's a lot of edits. Uh, I mean, Gal, how did you like the shift in the beginning from the past to the future? It was interesting. I mean, I trying to think back at like the first time I watched it. I don't know what I thought of it when I was a kid. Um, 
because I love it and know it so much, it's hard for me to really answer that. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I just, I love kind of the foreshadowing of mm -hmm. the priest mm -hmm. to later on in the movie where the, so like you were questioning the morals of the priest. Like, is he, he's trying to poison them. Is he good? Is he bad? And it's more, you kind of learn later on that it's these priests are doing what's like the, for the greater good. They have to do yeah. questionable things in order because they're the ones that have this um, uh, weight on their shoulders because they have to facilitate the evil being destroyed. And so that's more what I love of like the between the transition is just mm -hmm. kind of they're giving you that little nugget of foreshadow where you don't really know. And then later on, there are certain things that the priest thousands of years or hundreds of years later. Um, we know it is thousands, whatever. It's hundreds. No, it's hundreds. It's hundreds. hundreds. Yeah. It's hundreds. I'm, yeah. I'm bad at math. Don't judge me. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're not Asian. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, to where like you, you see them and you're just like, Oh, okay. Okay. I, I see. I see what they were doing there. So that's, that's more what I appreciate to protect between. life. That's why yes. we do this to protect life it, in greater good is the best way to put it. It's about making sure I mean, one, one loss of life is a tragedy, but we're talking mm -hmm. about the universe here because the darkness, the evil, Mr. Shadow, as he's referred to the, the entity that mm -hmm. is the, the dark planet, it wants nothing but to just wipe out life. There's no great battle to be had. It is just literally a ball of fire that will, after it plows through Earth, which it was created to be basically the, the barrel of the gun, so to speak, that for Le the bullet is Lilu, Earth is the gun, or, the, or at least the temple is the barrel and Earth is the gun. And after that, then it will just go everywhere. Boom, 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 get bigger and bigger and bigger until everything has been destroyed. It wants nothing except oblivion. And that's why Mr. Shadow, even though he is the ultimate evil in this, it's such a simple thing when it transitions from the his from the past to the to the beginning story where you see it forming that eclipse. And I find it funny we're watching this and in, in, in two days there's an eclipse. So now we're all thinking, oh shit, Mr. Shadow is here. Um, What's but, more funny? Sorry, um, no, right. you just right. reminded me. More foreshadowing is kind of like a comparison between. So one of my favorite things to quote from the movie is actually from the beginning. My brother and I um, have like a, a thing where we're like, Aziz, light. <laughs> and it's to like turn the light off or the light on. Um, and then you talking about Mr. Shadow, I feel like, I don't know if there's, I don't know the right word, but um, they, they're emphasizing Aziz, light in the beginning. And later on when the Mr. Shadow is coming to take all light the shadow yes. over yeah, yeah you see the flaming yeah the flames of, of the dark planet coming yeah it's good that's a good point that didn't even that didn't even occur to me it um, literally just came to me and i've seen this movie thousands of times what i, I want to <laughs> talk about mr shadow for a minute here because as again as the <laughs> threat he's he's the threat but zorg is the villain and that's an interesting dynamic they, they created but i love the idea that mr shadow is just that he's there he's a threat and Whenever he is in somebody, his presence is for is ominous on somebody, like when he's on the throne phone with Zorg or the original uh what's it called? The original um ship is attacking him to, to evil begets evil moment. The brown goop never explained, and I like it that way. I yeah. like it that it's just this thing has such it, it warps reality so much when you're in its presence. Brown goop will appear on you barbecue sauce barbecue That's what sauce. i always thought it was and and <laughs> what i love is after zorg's encounter on the phone call when he it stops he messes with it and you can mm -hmm. see it just was there it, it's not spot and it's i i like that idea of this thing is a threat you're not supposed to know it's in fact i'd even go i'd say eldritch almost almost it is something beyond your comprehension mm -hmm. and i yeah. and i like the way that works all right so Let's well, uh, ju we'll just, just talking it. about that real quick, the, yeah. the brown goo. Of course, I'd like to know how he's doing it. I, I'm one of those mm -hmm. people who really likes to dive <laughs> into the world building and lore of things. But if the film's not going to tell me, which I think is totally fine in the context, like you're saying, it's something otherworldly, uh, beyond human comprehension. I really appreciate how the film 
let a trust to the audience it's such a simple thing back in the day but because of modern yeah. movies we have to emphasize yeah. it that a modern movie would just be like oh look at the brown goo on his face it's from mr shadow mm -hmm. like, yeah we can put two oh, and two together you just talked yeah. about shadow didn't you oh uh -huh. <laughs> there, there'd be someone walking in making mm -hmm. an awful reference or when the the uh the admiral at the beginning of the captain at the beginning got it right before his ship blew up yeah. some officer just looked at him and was like oh mr shadow's inside you isn't he mm -hmm. it's like no the the movie lets you figure it out and it's not anything complicated so it's not like a profound piece of trust in the audience like something like inception but it is something that we have to note in the modern yeah. movie landscape and once again, Mr. Shadow, his his introduction, it's all visuals. It's all visuals. The 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 dimensional rift that creates the planet as it grows. We see evil begets evil. And then I really always like the moment because I bring up the transitional from that moment to the next scene with Corbin waking up when Mr. Shadow goes after the ships as it explodes. Goes up, you see that skull, that that grinning yeah. skull just lunge into the camera and then Corbin wakes up and you, 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 you miss it blinking you miss it Corbin in his opening moments there mentions I just had a nightmare mm -hmm. so was he I was I wonder is he connected to this somehow like beyond just yeah. yeah part is it and and <clears throat> what's going to the characters then because we get introduced to Corbin Dallas right away our down on his luck protagonist our hero or or actually wait yeah yeah, yeah, because we go to Corbin, and then we go to the. I'm, I'm trying. I just watched it today. It's all fresh, but I'm I'm jumbling it in my head because I, I want to. I'm oh, trying to decide how to talk about this. Go ahead. Jake. If we're going chronologically, yeah. we uh, could we talk about the president and his crew that we saw a lot in the beginning, mm -hmm. and yeah, the sure. priest. Yeah. So uh, the president storyline, I'm afraid to admit, is one of my least favorite parts of the movie. I love that actor from The Dark Knight. He was incredible in The Dark Knight, but in this film, it, it just came across as weird and way more campy than the rest of the film so mm -hmm. I, I feel like we could have cut out a lot of the present storyline and still understood what was going on because we find out a lot of this information from the prologue and from the priest later on with Lilu that mm -hmm. it, with how long the runtime of the movie already is we could have cut out the president near entirely and his his whole mm -hmm. gang I, I, th I what I like I think it still works because it shows sort of the slight incompetence of government at work oh it's so yeah. incompetent where they have to rely on a radio broadcast yeah. for Intel. Yeah. That is horrendously embarrassing. Uh, but I do love though that because then once again that in that part there, you get the you get also the introduction of Ian Holmes priest Fido Cornelius. Ian Holm. Oh, he, he's my favorite character so in the movie. Yeah. The bar he, none. He balances his performance so well between the dramatic and the slight comic relief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sl just slight and that it only works because of his ability to perform. It's 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 I, I every time I do that every time it's like y'all did it it's it's yeah. it's it, it, every time every time <laughs> he's great it. and he the, it, Vito Cornelius is fantastic and I gotta admit this I this comes from a period of time and it's only ingraining me because that's how I looked at Louisa for a certain while I would always try and cast characters in a party for an RPG and I'm like oh we got our healer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I always saw that but all right so we after the whole introduction of Dar of Mr. Shadow entering and Vito's defeat and we get we get the introduction to Corbin and listen Bruce Willis doesn't do anything special in this role he's he's Bruce Willis he's, he's just doing, Bruce Willis he's doing the Bruce Willis Bruno thing he's great at it but yeah yeah, he's, yep. yeah. It, it, it's not John McClane it's not anything but it's still just Bruce Willis doing his thing, and I love every second of it mm -hmm. because you remember that this is still this is the mid to late nineties. Bruce Willis is still one of those classic action stars from the eighties, still getting it done. And you got to realize there's only one and a half action set pieces in this movie. Mm -hmm. There's Lilu kicking ass during the opera scene, and then there's Corbin annihilating the Mangalores. That's yeah. it. That's it. So you basically. You have an action star, but you got you give him one action scene, and you saved it. Of course, also, I'll, I'll, I'll wait till I take it. I'll talk. We'll, we'll talk about that in 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 in, in, uh, in detail there. The introduction of Corp. Um, I like this type of thing, at least his introduction, because through his behavior 
and his interactions on the phone with fingers and then looking around his apartment, you get everything you need to know about Corbin in less than three minutes. Oh, it's a master class in character introduction. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, everything. Th there's a few over the top lines that are just like mm -hmm. exposition, bold face exposition, but you know, all the subtlety like you're talking about with the phone call he had, the little things around his apartment, throwaway yep. comments. We're getting a very good layout for the apartment, which is important later when Lee Loop shows up for the first time mm -hmm. with the priest and everyone else. Like that scene is probably my favorite one from a writing standpoint, just because of how concise and well written and well you know directed mm -hmm. the production design everything was working so well for that scene and what i love in that first so you get the, i love the whole, whole show don't tell you see all the award, the military awards his conversation your finger lets him know you you also hear you realize he has he's, he's a man suffering from a broken heart and that's mm -hmm. i mean gal you can appreciate this i bet because you're like me with these things now you realize oh our, i think we're in a romance movie too i think we're in a romance movie and oh yeah and in that, listen, we know I am a giant girl on the inside of these things. <laughs> I love this stuff. I love a good romance movie. I do. I love a good romance, rom well done romance in a movie. And realize this is a man with a broken heart who just want, doesn't want a million women, just wants one. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh. Oh, yeah. It gets to you just like from, there's so many aspects of his character that you just, they just get thrown at you in mm -hmm. such a great way. Like, and it's, it's very subtle certain things like he's trying to quit smoking. Um, he's a military man. He's somewhat jaded from his past. He's no nonsense. There's so much information that you get about him in just like one scene and that makes him such a great character. The matches. Yes. Matches. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. This, there, there is the setup. Yep. More. Oh, that is the most, Bold face Chekhov's gun that I've <laughs> oh <my> God. <laughs> buried a long time. He just takes okay, I'm just gonna come back. And I honestly, one of my favorite moments in the entire movie is when he after he's gonna leave the leave the apartment and the crazy junkie is outside with, with the yes. with the hat thing. I love that whole thing. And I gotta I gotta believe when Bruce Willis starts to smile and goes, nice hat, I gotta believe that he broke. And they decided to keep that cut mm -hmm. yeah. because it was just too good. You like it? <laughs> well, that that continuation <laughs> scene also is doing so many different things. It's not just comedic relief. It's not just you know world building when it comes to oh, this seems to be a regular occurrence. But it also is demonstrating his skills, his weapons yep. collections, yep. getting yep. up his, his arsenal that he made. Is all that move with the gun, boom. <laughs> I hated this side so much. When he holds his pistol out and he's got like the gangster friggin' But it's a space gun. gun. It's, a, know, it's a futuristic gun. It's okay. It's good. There it is. It's just, just give me the cash. <laughs> I love that whole scene. It makes me laugh yes. every time. And then the guy just did a little dance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and and then we move on. Uh, and then we get to the uh, Mondo Chiwon coming in. They're coming in. Well, actually, we already had that, the destruction, everything, where mm -hmm. the monitor went to That was previous scene. But now we get to the introduction of Lilu and we the survivor. It's just the hand. Mm -hmm. And now this one thing, wow, it's just a hand. And we realize 300 years later, this is the level of technology that they've advanced to at this point. They can right. rebuild something. And uh, I guess one criticism somebody might be curious of, how is it that she's still Lilu like that? And I would say supreme being, genetic mm -hmm. memory. One as long as one mm -hmm. cell survives, I I would believe that her creators would allow her her entire existence to continue. She's a completely advanced created specimen. Well, it, it is the foundation of the Assassin's Creed franchise as well as genetic mm -hmm. memory, memory in your DNA, and so I can see it. I, I I actually see more the argument that she is a clone of the original with the memories of the original. Either one could work. I think either, either one, one can work, and yeah. it's fine being ambiguous yeah. about it, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't clear at first to me. Like that hand looked like one of the alien hands, not it looked the... like a monarchy right. one and, hand. Yeah, so that's why I was confused yeah. at first when she came out. Everybody was. We all yeah. were. <laughs> I, I yeah. thought it was gonna be one of the aliens. And You're I'm not alone. This is a PG thirteen movie considering how much boobies. You... Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I, yeah you it, see that in the background. In her, it has to be in her contract. She uh, she's yeah. actually asked to be nude in movies before. I think she hey, hey, likes hey. it. Back in the day, young Mila. I'm okay with it. It's hey. pretty much, there were like, I think a minimum of three movies around the same time where when you first meet her character, she's just naked. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. It's hilarious mm-hmm. to yeah, me. No, she, <laughs> and just what she likes to do. Yep. Hey, hey, listen. No I respect shame, her for it. No Good. shame to Mila's game back yep. in the 90s. Not I, at I, all. It just surprises me that it's PG-13 in the I 90s. Know. If it were the 80s or the 70s, ratings were different back then. Yeah. But yeah, she's she's naked twice in the movie. Three. Three, Three times. There's the this thermal bandages, which is a lingering shot. Right. I just want to take some pictures for the archives. It's so good. I for love that so much. Uh, and then after, then when uh, she gets changed in Vito's apartment. They really do make her perfect. <laughs> and then when after auto wash and then after auto did, wash. did they show anything I, I knew she got undressed but i didn't it was see blurred anything. it was blurred okay. you're slightly out of focus because you're focused on the men who all the men are gentlemen they all turn around but yeah. it's well, all of them bruce willis is usually a gentleman uh, except for when he tries to pull a snow white yeah <laughs> <laughs> seno octogama never without my permission <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was a bad idea. Bad idea. Should have I that. was surprised, like, when I recently watched it for this, again, just, that's totally the reason why it wasn't, because I just love watching it. Um, <laughs> Seeing it blurred in the background, like, you do see nipple for both, mm-hmm. like, when I'm they looking. turn around. They do make her perfect. <laughs> like I'm looking. Yeah, of course. Oh, I'm yeah, you, you yeah. see it, yeah. Every time, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and it's, so, <laughs> yeah, so we get the introduction of Lilu, and as far as a character introduction, once again, every character introduction in this movie to me is spot on because you get everything you need to know and you get Lilu brought back to life. Her body in that moment, uh, Mila doing perfect body art of her organs reacting to air and her brain turning back on, completely shocked by her surroundings. Mm-hmm. And her, her, how do I put this? Her alien gibberish. Her alien gibberish. I love it. Mm-hmm. I love it. The, the, the language of creation, I believe is what Vito calls it. Language mm-hmm. of creation. And she starts rambling and babbling and everybody has no idea. They, they, they're all confident. It's fine. It's that. But then in that moment, when he says, if you want to get out of here, got to work on your communication skills. And it's unbreakable. That's unbreakable glass. Don't worry. No. Uh, right away. We're dealing with a superhuman individual. Mm-hmm. And this is where in 1997, in the 80s and 90s, early 2000s, we never questioned these types of situations. We never complained, oh, it's a 90-pound girl kicking all kinds of ass. Because in these types of situations, they made it legitimate. Yeah, they explained it. Yeah. yeah. she's She is... 200,000 mammal groups, not mm-hmm. human, uh, completely alien. Punching through the glass makes perfect sense. And we don't question the rest of the movie that 100-pound <clears throat> Mila Jovovich is kicking ass the rest of the way because she is supreme being. Right. Well, the, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. They, they even call a call back to it. Like when she, her demeanor instantly changes. Um, there's a couple things that, that animalistic that stare. When and she not even just that him. they, they give you the audio cue where, you know, she's built from so many different animal mammal, mammals mm-hmm. and instantly, like she understands what that guy is doing. Mm-hmm. Just like completely being an ass and it, it flips that switch, but then the audio cue of, oh, she's channeling her animalistic abilities mm-hmm. just with like the Jaguar type noise yeah. that you're hearing yep. sounds. And it's, it's again with the foreshadowing this movie, I feel like foreshadows so much. Um, <clears throat> and I just lost my train of thought. It was. Oh, oh yeah, her ability is so she is speaking this gibberish, doesn't know what's going on around her, and just seeing what she's seeing in that room. And then he does that, and you can just see that she just understood him mm-hmm. without understanding him fully. And then she's just so quick to learn her surroundings and understand what's going on in it later in the movie. She's she's able to just go through like the microfiche yeah. type of yeah. fast learning. Yep. Yeah. It's such yep. a it's well. That's her. She's she. Her brain can assimilate the information. That's why yep. she can just watch Bruce Lee's 
mannerisms and mm -hmm. tattoo it to muscle memory on her. And we don't question it. Yeah. Because they give us the setup that she's not right. human. We are no, we are not. It's an era where we weren't worried about tiny little girl beating up big men because mm -hmm. it's a science fiction setting. It's a science fantasy setting where we accept it and we just roll with it and we're in for the ride. And like you said, one of my favorite moments in that scene is after she's crawled out of the glass and she says something. I love the camera effect of, of where her eyes are just darting from her point of view. She's visually calculating everything and what's a threat is that. And then she's, yeah, I'm, I'm going out. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm bailing. I'm bailing. Yeah. And Jed, did you like her introduction to Corbin? When she landed? Uh-oh. <laughs> No, no. In retrospect, <laughs> in retrospect, <clears throat> when the when the scene actually happened, totally fine. I I have a massive problem with coincidences in movies. Mm -hmm. There are acceptable <laughs> ones. There are unacceptable ones. Right. My problem is if this were just the inciting incident of involving Corbin in the movie, inciting incidents as being coincidences, totally fine. That's how he's a part of the movie. Great, no problem there whatsoever. But that is retroactively undone by the fact that he's the one person that the government can trust to go on that mission anyway so he already has a relationship with her so he's already up to date on everything that's going on like either introduction for his character is great either she falls into his cap that's how he becomes part of the movie or they come to his apartment and enlist his help both that them both existing in the story is just too massive of a coincidence and it breaks immersion for me it is my really? least favorite part of the movie Okay. I, it, it's going to drop significant points uh, in my overall score because of that. Because, yeah, they, they just can't both exist. She falls into the one person's car who is going to be instrumental in what the government wants to do and what everyone else wants to do. But I, that's where I would lean into that, into the fantasy aspect. They were, they were, it, it's fate drawing them together. Yeah. And that's they, why I'm not they only go so far with the fate and destiny stuff. They mention that this is a cycle, but they don't talk about fate and destiny to a strong but degree, especially when it comes to the priest. That's he not what I mean. Think everything's going to play out in a certain <clears throat> way according to prophecy. Well, that's not what I mean. I mean the fact that he is connected to what's going on because the incident he had he, he had a nightmare about the incident of of Mr. Shadow coming to our world, and mm -hmm. Lilu is of course the weapon. Therefore, I, I I'm. It you could call it headcanon. You could call mm -hmm. this headcanon. This is just my interpretation of it. They were being drawn together by these events. So when now I thought you were gonna take issue with her diving off the building. Uh, I thought you were she's, because... she's superhuman. She, okay. uh, yeah, he, okay. he caught her before she landed. No, no, yeah. no, that's totally fine. No, it's just the coincidence yeah. of okay. him being there and him being the exact person that the government was going to enlist in the end like i'm fine with either one being the case they just can't both coexist for me mm. okay see i i can understand it but in the in the end i'm relying on that these are the the forces of this universe making sure that some both of whom both these people who are connected to this in some fantastical manner are going to get together and the movie would need to go into that. I, I can okay. see that headcanon and I can see that being the explanation, but the movie mm -hmm. in no way even addressed. Oh my God, this is weird. What could have caused this? Like even Corbin doesn't realize, Oh my God, this is weird. I'm the one person in the city <laughs> that she fell into my cab. And as Andy's saying in the, uh, the chat, it, it is required for the plot to progress. And I find that as lazy. If this mm. this massive, unbelievable, unexplainable coincidence is the only way for plot progression, then you need to write something better. All right, I can, I can see, considering I understand how your brain works with all this stuff, I can understand why that sticky brain, brain works. <laughs> At this point, it's been long enough. <laughs> I can understand the point. Uh, but it's, I mean, Gal, are you like me? Are you okay with it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and that maybe uh, Jed is less of a romantic than the both of us. Um, <laughs> I feel like it, it's a vehicle for their romance. Yeah, that was yes. Bad, yeah. <laughs> she, uh, she falls into his life and it's love at first sight. Well, and he calls to it later when he's talking yeah. about it. Like yeah. she just dropped into his life. I can't remember yeah. exactly when what, he's talking how, fingers. Yes. Uh, when I, do, you ding the fender. You ding the goddamn fender. And it's like, I had a yeah. really big fair. Oh, yeah. Five, nine. One, uh, um, yeah. big, big fair fell <laughs> we'll, in my we'll life. We'll get to that actually. But yes. But, like... but, but I, here's the thing. Uh, 
I'm okay with it. Uh, once again, people maybe complain, oh, she just dove off the building, not doing anything. Superhuman. She mm-hmm, probably yeah. would have found a way to land and like do some acrobatics, be fine. Landing there at, at that point, they haven't explained yeah. how superhuman she is. Like, I, I find that completely believable within the framework yeah. that they've established for her. It's and just, it's a classic shot. I mean, I, oh, I yeah. already, I already put that's it away. The one it's, shot I've really seen before. It's the new uh, watching the film. When I've ha- I've had my that Blu-ray that I got recently, my upgrade finally, it's been on my wish list for a long time, and it's gone through several different covers. And th- the flying leap just now happens to be the cover that it's on now. So I'm, it is it's an iconic moment. Hell, when one of the original opening on the original opening for this show in its previous incarnation, mm-hmm. I had I that, that scene. That scene, mm-hmm. I had her going while she said Lilo Dallas multipass. I had it in there. I've since changed it because we brought in the show. But it is an iconic scene, and it leads to one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie, the car so, chase. Go ahead. Real quick, I chase. just wanted to mention, like, it's it's going to be very similar where it's my own head cannon, but it kind of leads to the, kind of the balance of the both of you. Um, when you did the Captain Planet, like, what's the fifth element, Adam? Heart. And then what's Jed's? And they're kind of, they go hand in hand. And my head cannon with it is all of his life choices led to these mo- these moments. Mm-hmm. He was in the military, former military, so that's his background. But it kind of, I feel like it leans towards the destiny prophecy type of stuff. And it actually makes me wonder every time before this, what actually say, what is the fifth element? Is it love? Is it life? Is it a combination thereof? Is it just Lilu, Or is it Lilu and past generations of her combined with an outside source to show that... Mm. That's to, to bring point. that together because n- nobody what knows evil. How, nobody knows how it works at this point yeah in the present there's no idea mm-hmm. and I, here's here's something i always had a theory of and this just might be me watching this movie for 20 years more uh <laughs> is corbin a descendant of billy i've always wondered that just it's just something is he a descendant of billy because yeah. billy wasn't killed by the mama could be it's just something I put in my head. I've always wondered that. I, maybe somebody has that thing. But the you get this whole scene, the introduction. Uh, it's that whole instant connection they have, and he is he is smitten, and she is just happy to find somebody receptive. She instantly mm-hmm. her that that her hyper instincts realize this is somebody who I can trust, even though he's going to steal a kiss from me in about twenty minutes. Um, <laughs> and then you get the whole thing. Please help. And mm-hmm. it's suddenly there's, and I, Jed, I know you can appreciate this compared to modern just only the juxtaposition. She's already established strong female character, but suddenly trapped. Please help. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's not above asking for help. Yeah, because in this moment, suddenly she realized she's overwhelmed. And yeah, there's not enough in, around her for her to know what to do. Trapped in the backseat of a cab <clears throat> with yeah. pops and guns, she's got nowhere to go. Mm hmm. She got nowhere to go. Please and she's help. desperately and, looking around for those cues to pick up on. Yeah. How do I get myself out of this? And there's nothing beyond that. Just one. please help. Yeah. And then it's, I, I love every bit of camera work in this where he's telling her, I can't help you. And then you see him pop down his rear view mirror and it's just his mm-hmm. eyes looking everything about is both up. And then it leads to one of my favorite scenes in the movie, which leads to a quick soundtrack story. I want to talk about car chase. I love the car chase. It's so good. It's mm-hmm. so well choreographed. It dialogue is I there are certain lines that, that I use all the time. People may not catch it in passing. And I love that track. That track that I guess it's a Middle Eastern track, I would I would say. But here's the thing. Way back in the day, we had these things called CDs. And we would buy really? them. Yeah, yeah. Little discs. I they look like they, really they look like our Blu-rays. But they were called CDs, and they just uh. had music on them, okay? And back in, I would say, the early 2000s, I finally got around to buying the Fifth Element soundtrack because I was like, oh, man, I, I'm, buying, I'm, 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 I'm making a CD collection. This is great. I'm building my CD collection. <laughs> and I got it. Guess which one track, the one track I wanted the most wasn't on it? This one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The, my favorite track in the movie wasn't on it. I don't know if I got some wrong edition. I don't know if it was some <laughs> version as that, but it wasn't <clears throat> on it. 
and I was pissed off. You didn't. I still listen to the CD over and over again. Don't get me wrong, (laughs) but I was angry. And I love this soundtrack. Now, the rest of the soundtrack is this great soundtrack. It's it's got a very unique, Mm -hmm. unique sound to it. But so the whole thing is great, and has some one of favorite lines where after. They've gone through where, and I'll let's be honest, what, what, there's several things I want to note in the car chasing. One, uh, McDonald's wins the franchise wars in this <laughs> yes. history line. Not Taco Bell. McDonald's. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> and that's a, that's a McDonald's I would gladly go to. Yes. 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 The, nope. the sex appeal of the future is uh, one of its few redeeming Listen, qualities for that society. I want to know what that golden box is. The golden menu, is, or, one golden yeah. menu. Okay. Hey, yeah. she, she, she's the golden menu. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, it survived Frantic Wars, and no, no automated kiosks there. Mm-hmm. They under McDonald's of the future understands sex sells. We're gonna mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe I should sells. cosplay the workers at some point, <laughs> or the flight attendants, or the flight attendants. The flight yes, attendants. both, both yeah. outfits. Yeah, work. valid. Both outfits work. <laughs> uh, so I love how the cops were basically not going to bother because it was lunchtime. Mm-hmm. And they were things was, haven't uh, changed throughout the years. No type of. And then because it's they were brilliant uh, case of world building, like what yeah. you're talking about with the cops. I love the car chase mainly because of the world building. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just little moments. And like let's that. talk about that with the car chase. You get a more world building. I want to quickly talk about the world building of this movie. It's in bits and pieces. You get very little overview, and you have to pay attention to the dialogue and the conversations and the pieces to understand that. Okay, we have the federated colonies, which is Central Earth. But when you get to the Grand Old Opry <laughs> remake on on um, Boston, uh, Boston Paradise. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to say Florin for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> Boston Paradise. You see, there are other humans there that clearly have other civilizations in the galaxy, like the mm-hmm. Emperor and his whore daughter. They um, clearly are some other ruling party. And so you get little bits and pieces here. You understand also there are other alien races because one time Ruby says, I've never heard this way about a human. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> Ruby, Ruby gets it on with anything. Mm-hmm. And you understand you, you get once you, you realize New York, this is, this is New York city. It's a megalopolis at this point. And clearly they just, they did the Jetsons thing where they just kept elevating higher and higher because the smog at the lower levels you understand that, but then you only get one shot of New York when they're leaving New York spaceport. You get mm-hmm. one grand shot of it. Mm-hmm. And it's a great the, shot. It's yep. a really beautiful shot. I, I, and, I don't want to hurt anyone, but uh, I actually found out yesterday who the Jetsons were. So I, I got that reference as of uh, yesterday. That's a dermy point on you now. That's a dermy point. You understand that, don't you? That's a dermy I, point. I don't know enough to mm-hmm. care. You hurt my soul. <laughs> See, that's the same reaction she does to Dermy. So you understand I'm right in saying that. Everybody who knows, knows. That's the same reaction. <laughs> I uh, I mistakenly thought it was uh, uh, the Flintstones. <laughs> when someone said the Jetsons, I'm like, well, that's a caveman one, it right? Happens same universe. Like, they, yes. No. They so um, leaned into that too. Yeah, like they did. Yeah, they did. It's they so did. good. Yeah. There's a lot of references to pop culture or previous things in this movie when you catch them. They're, they're yeah. all there. Uh but the world building is all there. It's little bits and pieces. And I appreciate it, even though one of my criticisms, I do want more. I want to understand what what this world really looks like. Yeah. But I'm kind of glad I don't know because they might have ruined it if they'd ever done a, a sequel, which they didn't do. Just don't even put that out there. Yeah, I know. I, well, you, 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 you remember. No. They were they no. were talking you remake should. last year. You remember that? No. Whispers of Remake were no. out there last year? No. They were out there. Not allowed. Yeah, not allowed. Anyway, uh, I've, I've lost my train of thought. Anyway, all right. So uh, we're up to uh, – clearly tonight, today, guys, we're walking through the movies. Because it's one of those ones. We're walking through the movie. Uh, I have something real quick. Go ahead. So in the in – the, the car chase scene with the cops. I always wonder, and I love that I wonder this. He says that line where we got lucky. If they don't follow you after like a mile, mile or maybe uh, it's two miles. they don't follow you at all. Yeah. yeah. But it, are they following because you just ruined this man's lunch? And how did no? They're following because they ruined the lunch. 
They felt like, good. And, that, and I love it. that. That's and that's it's, it's it. such a simple thing yeah. because it's like these cops are clearly, you know, things there are certain things well, that just never change. That's part of the world building thing. This is this the 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 confe the, the federated colonies. It sounds like they're a little dictatorial. You yeah. know, they have a president. Oh, yeah. There's the, a these, commentary with this about military and government. Yeah, I feel, and because the cops are essentially <laughs> soldiers in this. Yeah, and they, yeah. Uh, I mean, they do they, you're in well, your and room. they're sell. What's his bucket? Zorg uses them at mm -hmm. one yeah. point in the film. Yeah, yep. And in everybody's room to put your hands on the yellow circles. This, this mm -hmm. is a police uh, inspection. And they're also uh -uh, used I'm to need it. Popsicle. Yeah, popsicle. Okay, one of the most <laughs> famous lines in the movie. Sir, are you human? No, I am a meat <laughs> popsicle. And the deadpan delivery yeah. mm -hmm. is so good. That's Bruce Willis. That's Bruce yep. Willis. That's Bruce Willis. Yeah, and it's like it a comedic moment comedy. that is just, it's... And, yeah. but so okay. we now move on to the part where we've had, we've, we've seen him for a couple seconds and now with the whole dropping off of Lilu at the apartment and then after that, we're going to get our full introduction of Zorg. Mm -hmm. Gary Oldman. Yes. The man just goes full hillbilly supervillain <clears throat> camp. And I love it. Jean-Baptiste Emmanuel Zorg. Well, and... you, get, you just get this feeling. So the whole, uh, we've got to lay off 500,000 people. One million. It's in one tiny tiny little line he delivers his evil mm -hmm. in the look character the, arc he looks at that poor little scrub because mm -hmm. this one million sir oof, i'm gone right and, it's just like fire a million and, and the, oh he's so scared he's just like 500 th yes sir yes sir yes sir it's just uh, so good and he's on his way to picking up the stones from from the Mangalores mm -hmm. from Ag from Agnot who took it who killed them on the Chi ones, and that whole <laughs> scene because then of course we get that scene which leads to bring me the priest but the, that that is also a fan favorite scene the, the weapons demonstration the uh, of the uh, the ZX I don't remember its name I never remember that thing's name uh, that thing has appeared in other uh, science fiction too that gun mm -hmm. it has been reused just because yes. it's a glorious little thing. <laughs> Uh, but all, all, all Zorg oldies, but goldies. Uh, and the, the, uh, the fame Thor, my favorite. Uh, it's so I, good. I, I, Gary Oldman, this is why you love Gary Oldman. He is one of those guys that can transform himself mm -hmm. into another yes. character. The man deserves many Oscars. Yes. And uh, so I, it, it, it's, he, he makes the movie fun mm -hmm. because he is a, I mean, Jed, good guys and bad guys. There's no gray area. We've got our heroes, and we've got mm -hmm. a villain, a died in the world to quote him killer, which he loves. It's great. I, I know you you commented, Jed, how you felt it was a little over top though, but you gotta love Gary Oldman overall in this. You gotta love. Him. Yes, he he is an incredible actor. So there are of course moments that I enjoy, and I realize it's purely subjective when I say that it, it was just it didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. But uh, plenty of other people, I can see why people love his performance in the movie. So of course I can't fault the film for doing something that doesn't personally work for mm -hmm. me. I I do have some issues with his writing, especially the inconsistency of his power and influence. Like one moment he's weaponizing an entire police force and he's showing how little 500,000 to a million jobs are, yet mm -hmm. it, he needs, uh, what's his bucket, um, Corbin's tickets to get to the pleasure yacht. And then at the end, he doesn't need it and he can just show well, up and they I let him on anyway. I think he was trying to do it subtly. I think he was well, trying to be subtle because he realizes the, there was a, after the fiasco at the airport, he, he realizes. I mean, he can't buy his own tickets though. They were bought. They were sold out, though. He's uh, he he can you know with his power. I can see what his po saying. power and influence. That, but... I, I see as inconsistent, and with how how many henchmen he could have because he weaponizes an entire police force. He doesn't bring anyone with him well, to he, the pleasure well, yacht he, at the end. He weaponizes he only... it, but he he does it through subversion. He doesn't actually buy off the police. He does it through uh, it's true, a terrorist but threat. He, he only really has one actual henchman. And as soon as that guy's gone, he's on his own and that just well, feels he weird chooses, with how well he says the line you want something done right you do it yourself exactly that was gonna be he my point like he's fed up at this point though. yeah he can be fed up and go personally to do it i just don't believe he would 
go without any backup. I can see him doing it himself, but having you know, 10 guys I with him. I would disagree. I think at that moment, he is so dissatisfied with everybody else's screw-ups that he's like, screw it, I'm doing it myself. Because he's, of course, remember, at that point in the movie, he is being motivated by fear. Mm-hmm. He's got the fear of Mr. Shadow in him. And he's desperate by the end, him though. Try, like, all hands on deck. I see him going overboard and going all hands on deck. Like at this point, the level of power and influence he has to where he's even, you know, bugging the president, bringing a warship in to just threaten the hell out of that cruise liner and just dominate it. That's what's been set up as him having that capability. So I, I, I just see about, it very I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But, I feel like his pressure is economic, not military force it's economic well, and uh, epic uh, economic at a certain point can translate easily into any to other avenue force. yeah just like he used economic power to weaponize the police force mm-hmm. um, i just go ahead, yeah. he's he's very desperate by the end like you you can tell especially when he opens the, the chest again and they're not there and he well, just starts like that's that beautiful <laughs> continued it's a joke but it works every time right. somebody opens the box they think the stones yeah, yeah. are in it it's always and, empty. and, well, and that I, I see that as being a detriment though his desperation really? In his desperation, See, I, he decides to go alone. Him going is fine. In his desperation, mm-hmm. absolutely. Him going himself, but he's so desperate that he handicaps himself. I don't feel like it was a handicap because with just one thing, he could easily slip in and get the stones. Because he, I feel as though his desperation is the fact that he can only rely on himself at this point. He trusts nobody else. Right. This is only he's the only one that can get this shit done. And it's to me, I'm sold. I am sold on it. I understand mm-hmm. your criticism. Uh, but- it's just throughout the film an inconsistency on his abilities, his influence, his power, his decision making. He's just not only schizophrenic in his portrayal, schizophrenic in what he possesses, and and they don't really establish it. So, like, I'm kind of I'm not a full balance between the two of you, but I do understand what you're saying because mm-hmm. there are some inconsistencies in they don't allude they allude too much to what his power is exactly because like okay so he's this guy that oversees all of these companies but then also he has these abilities to weaponize the military like the the police force like where does it begin and end Mm. and it's 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 a little too vague with that i do i do agree with that that's where a little more world building would have been good. Yeah. And that that's why I say I, one of my criticisms is I, I want more world building. I'd like to know mm-hmm. what the shape of this, of the, of the federated colonies are, how, how, how powerful is Zorg. But for me, as I said, I kind of, I'm okay with understanding his reach is mostly financial. He can, well, I, that's how he manipulates things. Or what about the ticket information? Why right. did, and why is Corbin's ticket his only possibility? I'm gonna I'm gonna go with what the movie tells me there aren't any left, that well, they're all gone. And he had never planned matter, on going there. So and there's the matter of you know, uh, what if there are other winners? Just buy the tickets off someone, or he well, has, here's the thing uh, everybody's kind of already there. Someone the, w- this movie takes it, place over a 48 hour period. So the, I would say that everybody who had a ticket, with the exception of the one connected to the contest. Uh, which was which established early movie. It's not something that they pulled out of the rest to get the Corbin. It was established when Corbin woke up that morning mm-hmm. and we heard Ruby's uh, mm-hmm. ad for it on the radio. Uh, so I would say that all the tickets that, with the exception of that last flight leaving New York for that Corbin is on, they're now, already I, they're gone. I, I might have missed it, but didn't they say that Zorg was part of the funding for um, Ruby's radio show? I, like never he heard I never heard that. That, mm-hmm. that would be news to me. I've never, I never my, picked that up. And my understanding was like the government is the one that actually started and rigged. Was, it. Yeah, rigged it. Well, yeah. well, no, well, well, yeah, they, they, no, they, they no. The contest existed. Then they rigged the yeah. contest. Mm-hmm. They yeah. used yeah. that as the as the vehicle to get Corbin to Floston un- inconspicuously. But it is like a last minute thing. Um. So, and this is where I lean more towards what Adam is saying. Like you're getting there right when it's leaving. So like this contest was supposed to be like the last tickets yeah. for it. So Zorg didn't really have that information yet. And it was also garbled because the cockroach was, you, that's funny. The whole cockroach scene, it's just <laughs> getting so a little weird, <laughs> but it's funny. Cause I love it when he smashes it. Cause like, ah! I love that. <laughs> There's little moments. Cause uh, uh, it's the uh, weird little things that yeah. I love. It's just like, we, 
we're going to start jumping around now because we're yeah. over an hour and I want to, I want to, I want to get through it. Uh, but there's when Corbin drops off Lilu, there's never without my permission. There's, do you have any idea how, where, where she's coming from? Yes. I was there when she landed. Uh, it's all the little things, uh, weddings. Uh, no, no. Is that, they use that? Not really. And then again, the second time. Yes. But <laughs> I, let's I, I, with, to, to round this out. Let, let's just talk about a few of the, of the best scenes now. Uh, Zorg and Vito, Ian Holm and Gary Oldman just acting mm -hmm. in that scene, just portraying these characters perfectly and the dichotomy of the two sides, mm -hmm. chaos versus order, or one saying chaos begets order, the other one saying your chaos is nothing but destruction that doesn't bring about I, I love that scene. And then that, that slight little comic where he's choking on the cherry. Mm -hmm. And... He has to knock it out there. And and then the finish, you're a monster, Zork. I know. It's to me, it's well put together. And it just says it's it's two characters who it's the only time Zorg interacts with anybody of the main party. Except for Lilu. I'm sorry, Lilu, but he shoots out of that. Because one of one of the things I love is that Zorg, even though Zorg is basically something that's kind of ruining Corbin's life, Corbin is fired because of him. Yeah. Corbin has to do deal with all this extra shit because of the events Zorg's pulling. Zorg and Corbin never actually see each other. And they do in that one, they almost do the elevator when they're escaping mm -hmm. the, the, the hotel and the wolf howl, because I love that sound piece of soundtrack. Mm -hmm. They cross each other and they don't see it. I just love it. That scene is great in the in, in the office. Jed, I saw you wincing though when uh when I said that. <laughs> oh the, the chair scene, I love the writing of it, like the dialogue of it, especially Ian Holmes's portrayal. I, I think the cherry thing is a little too cheesy for me personally <laughs> just the fact that it happens it's like mm -hmm. oh yeah um this it's this. his arrogance though i was just it's, gonna say that damn it go ahead get, gal you go ahead you say it. You well it. i was just gonna totally say he's just so arrogant that he he is above everything he's making um all this technology to for the betterment of mm -hmm. the world and oh no I, I love the scene his like the, the idea of the scene but like does he choke all the time <laughs> Well, no, that was it's I think again, that's that moment of arrogance. That personally, I don't think it's coincidence. I think it's just him going, "I'm on top of the world," and he's so cavalier in that moment that he thinks he's won. And he, he wouldn't goes, choke all the time, right? Because like no one questions him. And in that does. moment, it was a moment of flair. He did mm -hmm. that in a moment of flair to intimidate Vito with what he was saying. Yeah. So he didn't calculate. Maybe I shouldn't swallow this water with the cherry in it whole, and. That's the whole point of the conversation. You're so inflated with your own ego mm -hmm. that you didn't account for one little change. And that's such a empire. real life situation, too. Like, there's many times where I've been in that situation where I'm being a cocky little shit and then something happens and I slip up. And yeah. I've also been on the opposite side where yeah. someone's being a cocky little shit. And sorry, I keep forgetting. Is it well, okay you can say shit. Guess? You can okay. say shit. Oh, yeah. Fuck Bro, that shit. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck <laughs> Yeah. But like we've all been in like, yeah, okay. I might be assuming I've been in these situations where I was the one being the cocky person. And then I've also been, ha, that's what you get. So that's, yeah, I love yeah. that. And it's, it's great. And that's fantastic. And I love that scene. Cause you got, as Chad is saying, two great actors just mm -hmm. playing off each other once more without them in there. I don't think without Oldman Holmes, it, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. They make oh, yeah. that scene. Yeah. Holmes in general is my favorite yeah. part of the movie because I've I've never seen him in even a slightly comedic role. Mm -hmm. Like I've really only ever seen him, at least to my memory, in Alien and Lord the of the five Rings. million times you watched Alien this year. Yeah, it's been a lot. <laughs> it has been a lot. I, I did finally watch uh, Alien vs. Predator, and I regret Ooh, that. Not as much, as I, re not as, much as I regret watching Covenant and Prometheus. Prometheus and Covenant. I was um, say it's better than those. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I might rather watch the Disney trilogy of Star Wars. I, I would. I would. Real. Like I said, Alien vs. Predator. The book is actually good, and the comics are good, but the uh, the movie is terrible. AVP is a a yeah guilty the, pleasure for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I accept. I'm in the major. It pulls major elements from the book. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't get it right. <laughs> I, I I realize I'm 100 percent in the minority, but there's only one alien film to me. There's he just is one. Wondering. He Gal he he likes alien better than aliens. Well, there is oh. only one alien. Yeah, but the first one, and then there's aliens. aliens the better there's, one. Uh, I see what you did there. Uh, but yeah, no, I I, I thought <laughs> getting off track was fine. 
getting off track. We'll review that someday, and we'll give Jed a chance to break it apart. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, yes. next scene I wanted to Jed mention it, the congregation of all the major parties in Corbin's apartment when Lilu and Vito come to steal his tickets with the gun. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything about that is just fantastic. People lie. Uh, it's, everything is fun. It, it, they they try to convince you. Oh, you're here to, you're here to save the planet. Okay, but before that, when General Monroe and his fat Princess Leia, an Asian dude, come in there, uh, that is just perfect. Mm -hmm. Shoving them into the freezer, you know, it's we don't fit. Sure, you will. Uh, he has me, to like force it in. Yeah, and then when after Lilo and Rick, then you get hands on there, meet Popsicle. Uh, it's smoke you wrong answer. Mm -hmm. Everything is glorious. And then you get it within all of that. You get, it's a lot of comedy, a lot of interchange. We get that mm -hmm. one sense of moment or a wash. Mm -hmm. Second time I've, I've had you in my arms today. And she just, and she's shivering. Oh, and she's, wash. Oh, wash. <laughs> Cornelius. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and then, uh, she goes auto wash. <laughs> that, that that it's that second act moment where she's learning she's learning English. Yeah, it just repeats words all the time. Mm -hmm. It's funny as hell. It's but so then simple. at least one of my favorite physical comedy moments is in this scene though. Uh, while he's talking about coffee, let's drink a lot of coffee's a priest. Cor Corbin turns his back. Vito sees the tickets, grabs it, mm -hmm. takes his medal of his trophy, and when he wallops. Corbin head. Bruce Willis reaction. Ugh! I laugh every time because it's just it just like people forget that Bruce Willis can do physical comedy. They mm -hmm. forget that, and it's like oh, it makes me laugh every time. And I love that entire that entire scene. Jed, you mentioned earlier you really like this that whole scene, right? Oh yeah, just just the shuffling around with people. We had already established the geography and the layout of the room, mm -hmm. so we 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 could see the foundation of all this. Nothing was really surprising, but it was interesting. The one thing is that fridge is massive. I don't yeah. know how much food that it's... one man needs. Right. I, I did. <laughs> I, I did have a question that could slightly hurt the scene for me, but uh, there was a moment where I wasn't paying attention, so I'm not uh, going to that point yet. How mm -hmm. much time was between him leaving Lilu at the priest's apartment? the government deciding we need Corbin and Corbin with the Asian guy getting his food. How much time passed uh, in that? I would say about two hours. Two it's hours? Like, it's a couple hours. It's a couple it, hours. At least in um, that part, it just felt super rushed that mm -hmm. everyone in the world immediately knew he had the tickets and all went for him simultaneously. Well, that's because it was on the, it was on the radio. They were blasting his name on the radio. Like, the the timing of it. It just, it just it, it, they announced his name, yes, and then he's already got the tickets, and everyone's already there and ready to pounce. It, it, it just, it, if it's only two hours, that seems well, he, they, they, as soon as they decided to do it, they rigged it. It was on the radio, and he first hears they, about it. Because, they also rigged it very quickly. Well, mm -hmm. that, that's government. Hey, it's government. Hey, and you go. and the the competition did you have to input for it like um. It was like a raffle that he would have had to I, add his name I, to. I, I, right, he like didn't have to know he Well, won. they yeah. did yeah. show that he did eat croquettes because we saw a box in his fridge early on in the oh, movie. Yeah. So he and doesn't. That was, that's how he, okay. He didn't enter. No, he he didn't enter at all. Mm -hmm. They could. They just took his military name and record and shoved mm -hmm. it in there. It oh, was absolutely. complete rigging. There was no it, legitimacy to that at all. He wasn't and even part of it. With how the, the police department, as we saw with the McDonald's scene, they don't care about anything. Mm -hmm. The fact that they mobilized as quickly as the aliens, as quickly as the priests, as quickly. It's just all these people showing up at exactly well, the same no, moment. No, 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 no. They weren't going after him for the ticket. They were going after him because that was he was – Zorg well, said that's a terrorist threat, and that's why well, they were... right. That's the that's the lie that they told him. But Zorg was doing that to get his ticket. So ultimately, it was for the right. ticket. They just didn't yeah. know the truth. Yeah, uh, but it, it was just if it's only two hours, that's a lot to happen in two hours. Hey, it's and, the future, man. You saw the mail; true. it's got the tubes that arrives quickly. That shit happens fast. It's a I, I just love, got one phone I love, call. And... I, I love the Asian food delivery guy. That that whole yes. bit was fun, and how he just like comes up to their windows, drops off the food. Mm -hmm. That bit of world and he's in like man. a like a ship. It's yeah. it's and I love the delivery of the line. You are fired. <laughs> Cause he felt so, like they bet his meal type thing. It was great. Um, now, so I, I do love the scene. It, it's just 
that right. that whole sequence. Legata is... says it was two hours six minutes. That's what he says. Isn't uh, that the runtime of the movie? No, no. Was that the runtime of the movie? We're uh. Because it I was just know. over two hours. No, maybe Legatus is confused what we were saying. We're talking about how much time happened in that moment. I mm -hmm. say it's been a couple hours based upon that kind of stuff. Um, and either way, uh, it was uh, that scene is fun. And now that that's it when they get on the ship after the whole uh, spaceport scene with the garbage, uh, which is, is good. It's good. Uh, but we now we're in the third act. We're in the third mm -hmm. act. We're on Floston. We get introduced to Ruby Rod, Chris Tucker. And his over the top, his crazy hairdos, his obviously metrosexual style, but a poon hound. Mm -hmm. uh, I love it. Super green. Again, that's something so that's over is, the top. That again, so green. Though. Green has because of because of Fifth Element. Green entered our pop culture zeitgeist as saying, "Yeah, you green, super green," and, and, and entered. I use it all the time. I use it. I do it. It's great. I, I love that moment though. After the whole Corbin is introduced to Ruby and he goes through the whole stupid thing and they have a moment alone. He's trying to chastise Corbin like he can push this guy. Around. I'm Ruby Rod. I can push a peon around. And then Corbin goes, can we can we talk about that again? And then just grabs him by the neck, shoves him into the wall. And it shows you that Corbin may be a little stronger than we know as well because he lifts him off the floor. And they make a note to show you he's at least four to five inches off the floor there. Yeah, and that I love that moment. It's like I, I just I love that that Corb was like, I'm on a mission. You're gonna shut up, you silly little man. Mm -hmm. I don't have time for your crap. Crap. Like, yeah. Yet then we get on uh, the departure scene is also filled with so many good moments. Uh Ruby screwing the flight attendant, <laughs> just completely telling us, yeah, this guy. Well, he, he's horny. Corbin trying to talk to Lilu. Lilu basically saying, "Me fifth element, supreme mm -hmm. being. Me protect you." Mm -hmm. And she's not affected by the automated sleep. That's another thing that I always remark on. The the, the veto sneaking onto the plane. It's a, it's a great little scene. A very the, the two the two stoners who are in charge of putting the nuclear battery in the plane. It, it it's all. It all is a nice little combination. All sets it up where we arrive at Floston and we're all, all players are in place. Uh, Zorg blows up his his lackey and he says, I'm going to do it myself. And Floston, I think, is a fantastic setting for the third act on the hotel. Everything that goes down there. Let's talk about the opera scene and, and lead up build up. Uh, first of all, I like Lilu in this section because she goes off on her own and it's the juxtaposition when we get to the opera of everybody explaining, understanding what they want, what they need. And the opera itself, before the action scene, when she's solemnly singing that, that aria. Corbin entranced, Ruby entranced, Lilu looking longing. You, you can see they're right there. All that you mentioned earlier, Gal, when she's absorbing all the stuff by watching everything. She's living at this point. Whereas I think we're kind of led to believe every time she's woken up out of stasis to do this throughout her existence, she gets woken up, she does her creation of life business, and they put her back to sleep for however period of time. It's not very long. She never actually has to live. In these in this scant 48 hours, she has lived possibly for the first time in her entire existence. And hearing that kind of sorrowful, enchanting music, you can see on everybody, everybody does a great job emoting. It all comes out because she's standing there, leaning up against the wall, listening to it. And I love, the, I love that moment of everybody reacting to the aria. And then we get action. Then the action portion of the movie kicks into gear. Oh, mm -hmm. well, before we move on to the action, yeah. uh, I just want to mention that stuff with Leela is uh, there's a little aspect of it that I found great from both a writing standpoint and a humor standpoint is when the the singer's attendant tells her, you wait here. She takes it so literally like I will stand in this exact spot yeah. for five mm -hmm. hours. 
Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, the mentality. Like, she is, you know, virtually an infant when it comes to her development mentally. So, yeah. like, it makes perfect sense. Any other person would be like, all right, I'm going to wait in my room, wait till after the opera and come back. But she just is like, I'm not moving my feet. Right. I'm not going anywhere. And I love that little bit. They don't have to point it out. They don't even point it out. And I and I love, love that little bit. And it was... As I said, it's a great setup. It, you you see everybody's show don't tell emotions, yeah. And I appreciate that so much. And then the action starts. Then then the then the aria shifts into all that stuff, and we get Lilu kicking Mangalore ass because then she remembers that they were responsible for the destruction of the Mondachi one, m- nearly murdering her as well. Mm-hmm. And man, that that that, that all credit. Because this is also kind of that period of time where Mila Jovich became her little female action star status. Mm-hmm. She could do. She had the chops for it, and they proved it. And she did it, and she pulls off. It's a lot of fun, and that. And I, I miss those days where I can see a scene like that, and not, as I said earlier, question it. Where I'm just sitting back and enjoying it for what it is. Right, like girl boss galore, mm-hmm. and it was Robert built girl up. Boss. Yes, exactly. Like what a girl boss used to be and should be she's just the epitome of that yeah. and and she just comes into her own in that moment and the score behind it 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 is the mm-hmm. icing on the cake mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. it's i feel it's well, such a that's perfect arc for her why i mentioned earlier this is one of those movies where the soundtrack is intricate mm-hmm. to every little scene it, it is in the DNA of the movie. You cannot have these scenes without the soundtrack. It elevates it. It raises it higher. It makes it what it is. And, of course, the perfect timing. Dun, dun, dun. Mm-hmm. I mean, when Diva goes like this and then Lilu goes like this, like, yes, I have finished my performance. Yes. I get chills. But then, Just of course, we come down to Earth because Zorg pops mm-hmm. around. And girl boss kicking ass. Fine, physically, she's stronger, this and that, this, beat all the crap out of them, their guns weren't working. Zorg's got a gun that works. Mm-hmm. And she just realizes it right away, I gotta get the fuck out. And she gets hurt by it. She, she takes a couple winging shots that takes the wind out of her. Then the Mangalores attack, and you get Corbin doing a Bruce Willis thing. The one man, a one, one man army moment. Mm-hmm. It's well choreographed, even though, even on my old edition, I can still spot the stunt man, and I hate it every mm-hmm. time. Drives me nuts. Yeah, but I do it because what I hate the most is what I actually hate the most is that you see the stunt man, but it's the Bruce Willis scream of the ah, the, his classic. It, but it's a stunt yeah. man on the screen. It's like no, mm-hmm. I can see the stunt man. No, mm-hmm. uh, that whole thing. But leading up to that, where the diva says you, she needs your help and your love, and that's hammering it home. Mm-hmm. That this is more than just about her being a weapon. It's more than just about saving everything. It's about saving yourself. And him or that. Uh, uh, let me ask you about this. So I, I always wonder about this. I want to ask your opinion. How do you guys feel about the fact that the stones were inside her the whole time? I knew. You know, what? the moment I saw her on stage, I knew they were inside her. Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's I dumb. I don't know how it works. I mean, it's must be alien. I mean, alien. Yeah, that's the only yep, explanation alien. I could see. It but alien. it's exactly. it's still. Uh, I, as soon as I saw her, I'm like, oh yeah, the stones are absolutely in her. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And it's sad, but it's real. It, it, it drives it home that he just watched her perform this incredible piece of art, and then he she dies in his arms. And, but either way, Ruby and Corbin. Throughout their fight, uh, do you guys have any remarks on the on the on the action set pieces? I love it. I think it's a classic shoot 'em up. It has a little bit of uh, chaotic nature to it, where he he dominates yet is trapped several times. A little comedy. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Ray. Uh, <laughs> I actually have a question for Jed. Okay. Do you know what American Gladiator is? I've heard of it, but I definitely dun, dun, haven't dun, dun, seen dun, it. Dun, 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 dun. So the the weapon. That they have like the little like mini the rocket grenade. launcher the thing. Mm. Uh, yeah, that that's straight out of out of American Gladiator. Mm. I loved watching that show as a kid, and oh. like so you don't get that, and so that's why I was that's why I asked the question. I was just like, do you know what it is? Say hi to mm. my mom, everybody. Um, <laughs> um, every like when I was a kid, I was just like, hey, that's from American Gladiator. 
so that whole set thing, piece. Uh, that whole set piece is great. Uh, yes. it, 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 it has a little bit of edge to it in terms of he is, he, he's nearly dies a couple times. He talks his way out of it. Uh, yet he dominates when he needs to. He fights tactically intelligent. Jed, I do appreciate that he fights tactically intelligent in that whole fight. Oh yeah. He's definitely taking advantage of, you know, the landscape, right? It's one of those things that I call a, a dynamic fight scene where they mm -hmm. incorporate the, the scene and the environment, environmental storytelling. And I, I always love that modern fight sequences are so static. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, he, he's definitely strategic about it. And it, you know, it was set up throughout the film that he has these expertise mm -hmm. to make it make sense. Just like Lilu, just with her yeah. superhuman abilities, they, properly foreshadow and set up his ability to totally decimate because as the general said he's one of the best fighters that the hum uh, humanities uh, produced at the time and uh we just gotta say i, I gotta say this, chris tucker is so goddamn annoying in the scene though so ruby shrieking is just oh uh, yes but it, it is. it's it's, but it's over the character. top it's on character over yeah. the top the screaming even when it's still even when it's all over <laughs> and he's well, doing his show the whole time is the funny part it's the whole show and it's I feel like it's it it's exactly how that character would in real life be mm -hmm. like yeah. he's this metro dude that loves women and that type of person in an actual serious moment is going to freak out the way that he does. Come mm -hmm. on, man. Come on, man. I hope you're right. I got a headache. Come, come, I got a headache. Come, 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 the big and the ugly. Because <laughs> if, if it's a bomb. Now, Chris oh, Tucker does a great job. Not a lot. Chris he, Tucker he does. does a great job. It, it's kind of the situation of uh, Gary Oldman for me, where it's it's a bit much for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just don't generally lead towards campy films. But you that accept much. it. I do. Absolutely. It is yeah. definitely what the film intended to be. And it was good yeah. for the film. It, ju it just is very subjective with me where it, it doesn't you work. Your me. line earlier, they're not taking themselves seriously. And when oh, you absolutely. understand that, you can't really criticize it objectively because they mm -hmm. know what they're doing. They they're lean doing into it so much. They're, they're yeah. giving him a giant penis hairdo on purpose. A pompadour, okay. or whatever that's called. That yes. is a pompadour. Yeah. It's a serious pompadour, but it, it is very phallic at the yes. same time. Yes, absolutely. Because uh, that is uh, what he is. <laughs> And it's great. And then, of course, the best thing: we're sending somebody in to negotiate. <laughs> Mangalores won't fight without a leader. He just and that see that they use that in one of the in, in one of the bits of later promotional material that you see for it afterwards. Where they always use that part. We're sending and he just walks in. Boom, gangs. Mm -hmm. and, that, and here's the thing: you're saying Agnot has been had been set up as a nice little thug foil. He's a boss. He commands. He has intelligence. And Corbin just walks right in, shoots him right between mm -hmm. the eyes without blinking. No nonsense. No. He like, and he's he's fed up with his life prior to this. Like he doesn't have the time to care enough to actually negotiate. It is just on character for him. And mm -hmm. I love that it's orc rules. War boss dead. We mm -hmm. give up. Yep. War boss is dead. We're done. Yep. It's it's over. It's done. It's over. Uh then uh I love that line. Uh, when Vito comes over, who I didn't expect that. Zoop, what are you doing now? I'm looking for Lilu. Lilu in trouble? When is Lilu not in trouble? Yeah. And he just sees her arm hanging out of the vent. He goes to get her, and then, and then there's the great moment. There's the, is, is, is that is that a bomb? It's not a bomb. It can't be a bomb. Mm -hmm. It's 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 <laughs> Corporal Corp, 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 can you stop this? And this that that moment looks looks at him. Russell goes, eh. Then they're running for it. They're running. <laughs> then they're running. Like, no, we can't stop this. Uh, and that once more, the juxtaposition of Zor coming in as they're leaving. Mm -hmm. uh, he just straight up ganks those poor security officers. Bur Sir, there there's a bomb on the hotel. I know. <laughs> and he so thinks good. he gets away with it. Zor mm -hmm. thinks he gets away with it. Whew. But then the Mangalores get there unknown vengeance on him yeah and oh no and then <laughs> that's it that's how zord goes out and i like i love it our mm -hmm. hero never actually puts his hands on the villain because once again i state zord is the villain mr mm -hmm. shadow is the threat he never forgets his hands on him. doesn't even know he's a th doesn't even know he's the villain only Vito and lilu sort of know lilu sort of knows that zord yeah. is the villain Corbett's just doing his job and trying to protect Lilu. That's all he's trying to do. 
Well, and Zorg is also, he's Corbin's Mr. Shadow. Yeah. But Corbin doesn't even know it. Like, yep. he has fucked up Corbin's life so much. And he has no idea. Yep. He's just there to be the no-nonsense hero type that is going to fix it some way, somehow. And yep. uh, we here's the final moments now, which are, to me, very powerful. Every time, I'm always riveted whenever I watch it. Lilu getting patched up by Corbin. He's asking her, how you doing? How you feeling? Uh, so, uh, before we oh, move oh, on oh. Uh, from Zorg's death, okay, yeah. uh, I, I might have missed something, but I, hmm. I really wish there was actual setup for that second bomb that was there. Well, they like, carried I, it in there. They carried it in there. Right, but I, I just, like, they, they timed How it for exactly the, like, the virtually same the same like, moment the other one was going to go well, off. Well, he turned it. He turned the dial. The the the, the Mangalore who's dying, because we'd heard the countdown. Five. Mm -hmm. And then it stopped. And the Mangalore who is dying says, for the honor, and he turns the dial to five seconds. So I think that's close enough. It, then uh, then uh, why did that happen at the same time then? Right, like why are they linked? Because I've never understood linked. No, that. no, they weren't linked. He, that was a bomb. Oh, it was a separate bomb. Two separate bombs. Right, but the, 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 the other Mangalore... No, no, no. Was... The, the Mangalore heard the countdown. The, the ship mm -hmm. was counting down vocally. Mm -hmm. And then the Which Mangalore... Was going to so a, that a bomb... bomb that bomb is just the Mangalores brought that on themselves. Yeah, he activated it with, with it. He he had the Mangalore is lying on the ground, goes for the honor, and he has a dial in his hand. Mm -hmm. And you see him turn it, and that activated the bomb. So what's ago. in his hand is a bomb. No, was it is a detonator? Oh. That was the detonator. detonator. And Zorg's but, bomb was that tiny little thing. Right, right, That's right. Zorg, but yeah, did the did the ship stop counting down when Zorg disconnected yes. his bomb? Yes, and the the Mangalore recognized that. Yes, he just. Okay. Uh, I, I would say there's enough evidence since you since you hear the ship counting down that he could then set it to five seconds. Just as I'm gonna, I'm dying. Just I'm while setting he's it to there. Five yeah, because the Mangalore heard it counting down. That's to me. There's so enough it's separate. Okay. If he if he was two able separate to, bombs. If he yeah. was no, I know they're two separate bombs. If he was able to know and react that the other bomb was turned off, that was the thing I was worried yeah. about. Is he knows that other one's off, so he sets his to the same time. But with what you're saying, yeah. Yeah. that makes sense. There were the, the ship stopped counting down. And then he hears it. And then I, the way I look at it, he just turned it to the same exact time because I'm dying. I'm going to set it to five seconds. Cause yeah. Make done. sure that everyone dies. Like, yeah. Yeah. I guess I, and I, from my misunderstanding of it is I thought that they were the same bomb. No. And so that's why it always confused me. Okay. No, they're two separate bombs. Oh, yeah. George yeah, the one was just the, the tiny one. one. And the I don't know how that tiny one thing. could blow up the entire ship. Right. But it was the tiny aspect Technology. that was bothering me. Technology. Yeah. It, it was the timing aspect that the oh, other okay. mangle the Mangalore knew that it was all happening. But if the computer was counting down and suddenly stopped, it was audible. It was him. audible. Yeah. Yeah. If he reacted to that, I, I just didn't hear the computer stop. I thought it was still going. It's as soon as Zork puts the, the chip in, it stops. It stops. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I okay. think then even then weren't is... there like like there was an it alarm was... sound with it. The, with the, the computer and the it ship's stops. the ship's computer was recognized telling everybody was what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. If it recognized that it was turned off, then yeah, that, that is set up yeah. in a way that makes sense. Absolutely. Now we go to the final setup here. We're on the Zorg ship, which has been commandeered by Corbin and crew. And he's talking to Lilu and she's now, you can see that everything has happened. She has the doubts. Mm -hmm. She, he's asking her, where are you in your, in your encyclopedia? I'm up to V and he's trying to get his most Corbin doesn't have quite the ability to be that kind of emotive. So he's trying to tell her, very, very beautiful. There's a lot of good words in V. Mm -hmm. And she's quite, but she's questioning things. And then while he's on the phone with the president, well, the war she, thing. Now, I knew I, I had a feeling you might question the war thing, Jed. I, I have two questions about it. Yeah. yeah. There's no other bad words in, in Encyclopedia before, before w. w. Yeah. No, like, I think bomb. Well, like maybe nuclear. Maybe, well, maybe. Well, like Yahtzee. Listen. Well, listen, 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 listen. All right, defend this. I'm gonna defend this. I was ready for this. I was ready for this. <laughs> I knew Jed was gonna was gonna comment on the the on um, the 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 war montage setting her off. One, of course, she probably saw the word bomb, but it's not in conjunction or connection to the war. Of course, you see nuclear. We've already seen nuclear is the primary energy that they're using. We saw it functions for the starship power source probably functions for everything power source which means when she saw nuclear if she went over it and we're not saying maybe she didn't go over everything she's high speed learning here mm -hmm. high speed assimilating information didn't do detail and she specifically types in war 
because every she all the just events experienced, now experienced yeah. like physical mm -hmm. fighting because yeah. she she questioned yeah. corbin a moment ago yeah. how, why is it everything you humans do everything you create you destroy he says human nature mm -hmm. and she doesn't understand that because she's not a human she's a mm -hmm. construct right. and now she, all that stuff has spurred her to look at what is war and yes do they show the same images over and over again as all the build up see a nuclear explosion yes and i just go back to what we talked about earlier visually she's able to interpret everything and there mm -hmm. there might have been we were only looking at, looking at one section of the screen there might have been words too she might have been mm -hmm. incorporating it all with her high speed ability to assimilate information so i think the impact all at once broke her in mm -hmm. that moment which mila jovovich does an excellent job Absolutely. of showing of emoting that the, the it, horror on her expression is great and that was also, more oh go ahead no go ahead nope no, no my, mine's a slight half change of subject. So you, you finish. Okay. Up. Well, so just to add a little bit more to it, like there's a difference between being book smart and street smart, like you're experiencing life versus reading about it. Um, and I, I feel like some of that does come into play with it and why I accept it as well, because I did, even as a kid, I was just like, W's at the end of the alphabet. There's a lot of like bad mm -hmm. things in murder. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, but she just she came to her own like i mentioned earlier where she is fighting she feels pain she feels um a sense of loss like she had given up and then corbin finds her like she's dying like that type mm -hmm. of feeling like she's actually experiencing it versus reading mm -hmm. about it and so she started thinking on those lines. remember like, what during during the um scenes during the battle when you see her trapped in the air duct, she's going, so, please help, because she yep. has, mm -hmm. she's injured. She thinks the stone, she too. thought the stones were in the box too. Mm -hmm. She didn't know the stones were yeah. in Plava Laguna. And yep. she thinks it's all over. She's now, she's as hopeless as Vito was back in the beginning yes. of the movie. Yeah. And she needs to be picked up and carried. And that's where Corbin comes into play. And that's the missing element there. One and all those say, emotions mm -hmm. kind of, especially she's as, not used a, to as them. a woman, like, this this is also a, a, a she she's also a woman so like when you're going through these emotions and everything's compounding you just start to like be in your head more Wait, like yeah, that's how yeah, I feel yeah. with that are, are are you are you telling us because you know because you're a girl <laughs> am I you understand? Yeah, are you <laughs> well I Adam know. identifies as a woman so only that one time I, I, I only that the one time, time. this is gonna be my time. moment God, damn it. We are. am I a woman not that was not my fault. <laughs> I misspoke. Did, did did Corbin say the word war in that conversation? No, he didn't. I think that would have helped a lot because yes. yeah, we know she was going through the like why uh, did the she encyclopedia, but it kind of went all over the place in the previous stuff. Like it wasn't always A B C. She was jumping yeah. around. So uh, I think if he had said the word war and she'd be like war war what is war and then she mm -hmm. specifically looks it up, I'm all good with that. But it is implied that but she already knew through. about destruction, so she obviously had seen the word war, but she hadn't seen about it she probably knew what war was but she needed to see human history of war up until that the history point. of the world and that's what that was she saw all the horrible things and that's why when they get to egypt and um uh kind of wimpy priest little boy has already set everything up for them uh everything's ready and here comes mr shadow and mm -hmm. everybody i'll see it, it will it will make it will hit earth in one hour 56 minutes i'll call you back in two hours I uh, love that. That's just confidence yeah, right there. It's Man, so that's good. Confidence. That's confidence. And they have that whole thing. Jed was going to bring go something up earlier go when okay. we yes. were. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. So, yeah, it is in tandem with that uh, Lilu stuff is. And uh, I have a headcanon explanation that I'm okay with. But mm -hmm. when we, we see Corbin pick her up in the hotel room after she's been shot, she's obviously very injured, barely in, mm -hmm. needing help, whatnot. And then in the spaceship, she seems to be, yes, she's injured, but she's relatively fine. And then I she's dying again. That. I was Let ready for this, too. Cannon. Let him I do his headcanon. Okay, I was ready for this, though. I, I assumed that as something to do with the proximity of the shadow was damaging her psyche. Uh... That I don't know about. I thought you were going to talk about her injuries. Injuries, um, yeah. I it, that no, that, that oh. like, yeah, I was totally fine with her being okay on the ship because, yeah, she probably has fast healing stuff. So. I was going to say, she, she it's already, the again. movie's already exhibited that all the injuries she suffered when he yes. escaped from the cops, so, they were healed like 20 minutes later. She's right. got rapid um, healing. I'm okay with that, but then they undo that, and then when they get to the temple, she's dying again. Um, it's like, oh, she's think, terrible. She's no. dying. She's totally no, 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 she's dying. No, 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 no,
because I think mm-hmm. she had given up. She had lost all hope. I was just going to say she's but, given up and lost yeah, hope given mentally. Up, but she w- have struggle speaking. She wouldn't have uh, struggled. Sh- I I think it's the I, the way I look at it is her injuries, physical injuries, were taken care of. It's mm-hmm. a spiritual thing because yeah. she says so. I why should I do this anymore? Is basically in the moment when they finally got the stone to activate. We're, that that seems great. A lot of fun mm-hmm. with that. Let's get to the core thing. Lilu, I need you to work, honey. It's time for you to work. Why should I do this? What What's the point it, of all this? It's definitely like a mental and emotional thing yeah. for, like, that's how I take it, too. Yeah. That she's showing it very physical, though. Like, she can't right. even speak. Even what she wants to say, she can't. So I'm going to, I'm actually going to bring this back to being a woman. And, and that's one reason why I love her character because she's like this supreme being, but she is also a woman. Like in the beginning, the reference, you know, he, I can't wait to meet him. And I, I'm not using this as an excuse to be weak, by the way, <laughs> just because she's a woman. This is the reason. But at the same time, it is a factor. Like they emphasize the fact that she is a woman and everybody thought she was mm-hmm. a guy. Um, it like when, when a woman, like I've personally been through this, so like, maybe I'm just putting my own life experience on things. Like when I, I mentally am at a state of giving up, like I, I curl up into a ball and cry in the shower. I like, I cannot stand the weight of th- that I'm feeling upon my shoulders so much so that I can't stand. Like, I, I think it's a common, I think that's, just a fair thing. And I think. I'm going with my thing. She is spiritually and mentally broken at this point Mm -hmm. because she feels like her entire existence is pointless because humanity has in, in in this brief experience where I met 48 hours have had highs and lows, but the lows are so uh, damaging to her psyche about why am I saving all this? Why am I saving life? Even humanity, all these aliens, the Mangalores, everything you destroy everything. What's the point of life? If all you want to do is destroy. And then, Everybody had been alluding to this in the third act. She's missing that one element, maybe the fifth element, love, to kindle hope. Mm-hmm. Because she's, she says it, I was built to protect. I was not built to love. Mm-hmm. And Corbin was trained to protect, but all he wants to do is have love. And he has love to give. And he fell in love with her, for, with, with love for sight. Therefore, when he is able to come to his come to the grips of the fact that I, I'm in love with this woman. And I have to tell her this because she, she says, tell me that you need me. If it, 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 it's that it's that it, it's a trope. Is it a trope? Yes. There are all these types of things doing something for one person. Sometimes the only reason you're able to find the strength to do something in these types of heroic fantasy, scientific stories, these adventure stories is that one person you do it for that one person, whether it's your significant other, whether it's your child, whether it was somebody else important who meant something to you. Sometimes that one thing is enough. And by him telling her, I love you. I need you. The fact that she is needed by just one person. That was enough to justify life. And it's, it's, is it a tried and true trope? Yes, but it's an acceptable trope as far as I'm concerned. And the triggering of it always gets me because uh, that's the romance of this thing. It, it's been building up. You get the payoff and victory. And it's, 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 a, it's a victory over the threat, not the villain. Because... The light of creation fires out of her in her pose when she was in her. I want to get say sar- her. Could that kind of as a, as a sarcophagus when we first see her in the beginning? Because clearly yeah, she isn't um, like this. Yeah. So that's just that's just it the, was the very mummy esque. So yeah, yeah. sarcophagus yeah. would be. Uh, I, well, if that interpretation that, yeah. is correct, yeah. I would imagine a a physical improvement to her once she accepted that she's going to start fighting because of Corbin. Like she's mm-hmm. still needing to be held up by him, which is well, like physical issues. after after she released light of creation, she's just afterwards, yeah, she's drained. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. fine. But like before the light goes off, she doesn't seem any better. I think she just wanted to die. I mean, I'm gonna throw this out there because we're actually gonna get to it in about a month and a half. Uh Range of the Sith when Padme is dying. Uh broken heart, just losing it all. Just giving up, giving up, shutting down, shutting down. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and so I know that's not a, a great defense, especially for like the feel that I get the little that I know about you, Jed, like you're not accepting like my reasoning because I'm a woman. That means that like you can't necessarily understand or Adam can't necessarily understand, but Adam does. So like I, I realize that I'm putting that onto it just as my experience as a woman. Mm -hmm. But when I was a kid, I, I didn't really have that experience beyond just being a kid which is also another explanation that I have in this is she's not fully an adult yet in her mind. So like a child will want to just give up because they're not getting their way. Mm -hmm. And that's also another reason. And what do they do? They'll like pout and just fall to the ground. So those are the things that I see that as maybe. And yeah, I don't know what I see it as, like, as I said before, it's her whole, and Legata's is going it's despair, it's hopelessness. She's mm -hmm. given up and she's broken. Like it's inside. her physical reaction yeah. to the yeah. the anguish and, that and, she's and, feeling. And I, I do love the light of creation thing. And I swear you guys can when when the light of creation hits Mr. Shadow, I swear I hear him screaming. I hear I hear like a scream from him. I I, I hear it too. I don't yeah. know about and also, there's a Bruce yeah. Willis scream mixed in there too, because he's like mm -hmm. point blank. I'm like, yeah. this. Ah. One thing yeah, I wanted to else, I would be terrified. <laughs> right. <laughs> there was something that you said, and it actually, I feel like it, for me, it puts a nice little bow on it because in the beginning, uh, we talked about how it's for the greater good, like sacrificing these individuals mm -hmm. uh, with the priest. And then in the end of the story, it actually is the reverse mm -hmm. where what saves it is the one, the, those mm -hmm. individuals in that moment save the greater good. Yep. Like in the be like, so one side of the coin is somebody has to sacrifice individuals for the greater good. But the other side of the coin is you also have to recognize the individuals are what make up the greater good. And we have to like, that saves everything. Mm -hmm. And before I, I forgot, because well my memory sucks, I had to say that. Well said, well said. I could not agree more. <laughs> uh, that's pretty much it. Then we get the nice little scene where they're humping in the reactor. Vic vic <laughs> a victory hump. Well earned. Well earned. They got it. They they deserve their moment. From uh, that, I I guess he he got hurt by the the light gun. Uh, they, he well Corbin took some bat. Hey, Corbin took classic Bruce Willis battle damage mm -hmm. in there, man. Classic. And so he took. They they needed just a little refresher, and then well, they woke and up and said, hey, "Also, it could there. be a combination of them." Um, like in the end, like that also drained from, from him. Like, like I said before, we don't know if it's just her, that's the fifth element mm -hmm. or is it both of them together? Like either way, it's a nice, happy ending. <laughs> I love a good, happy ending. It's a little, little, little comedy oh, there, yeah. little, mm -hmm. little sexual jokes, but Hey, the guy gets the girl, the girl gets the guy, the, everything's saved and it's nice and clean and it didn't need a sequel. <laughs> it didn't mm -mm. Need one. No. Um, anyway, so there you go. And we already we talked about the soundtrack throughout the whole thing, so I don't need to go. And I love the soundtrack. Told my story. It's in the DNA of the movie. It elevates the movie. It makes the movie the movie. Uh, so with that said, uh, let's score it. Gal, because you're your guest this week, I'll let you score it first so you're not influenced. Uh, it is, for me, it's a 9 out of 10 because I don't think any movie is perfect, but this is – absolutely close to it for me uh, and especially just even discussing it in this way I've never really had this type of conversation about this movie just the things it made me think more about it than just loving the movie because I can just fall asleep to it <laughs> we talked about that with the mummy um, <laughs> it's one of those for me of course but it's also one that I can just sit and rewatch and rewatch and mm -hmm. um it there's just uh, really small minor things that and you guys yeah. you it's also know things. that i don't do halves so it those little things that i don't like so much that even are my head canon that i will t subtract a mm -hmm. point but that is really the only reason the characters the story how they tie together the foreshadowing there's it's such a simple movie that actually has a lot of depth behind it that i give yeah. it a nine out of ten yeah all right nine out of ten uh i also <laughs> give it a nine out of ten uh I have very little criticisms about this movie. Uh, mine are mostly tiny little world building points. This didn't make sense here. That means I didn't really dig into it, but little things here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I always have a good time. I love everybody's performances in this. Uh, I, I forgive 
my little the little inconsistencies that I I harp on when I do this, I forgive them because I am I I will watch this multiple times in a year. It is a it is a feel good safe place movie for me, where I just want to watch something and have a good time, and it it's and I just I love its pop culture influences. The, there are so many little quotes. Mm -hmm. You want to play it soft, play it soft. You want to play it hard, just play it hard. Uh, all this kind of stuff. It it is a fun time, and I'm just glad Jed liked it. Although his me score too. probably won't reflect how much he actually subjectively liked. Mm -hmm. um, so, Jed, what do you got? What do you got on this one this week? Oh, well, uh, you did predict accurately. This movie is a lot of fun, and I would absolutely rewatch it gladly. And it, it, it's a dumb, fun movie as, as I see it. There's there's a lot of camp in it. It doesn't take itself seriously. And that reflects in the script as well, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It is what it intended to be, but that doesn't also make it a well-written masterpiece at the same time if i were going off a of subjective score i'd be giving it not far off from you guys an eight which is uh, high for me a if i were purely doing it off of uh, subjective enjoyment but i do believe that there are substantial writing flaws and uh, inconsistencies mm -hmm. the biggest of which being the fact that he is uh, the one that she falls into his car that mm -hmm. coincidence is just too too large for me to get over so I, I have to bring this one all the way down to a six out of 10. I had a feeling, I had a feeling, but you know what? That's fair. That's fair because uh, that that's the kind of stuff you look at. So I'm not going to question that. And listen, guys, you guys know by now that for Jed, that's good. That's good. That is good. That's good. It's good. Uh, anyway, there we go. There we have it. Fifth element. I had a fun time. Gal, when you're not in Vegas this week, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on my channel. I recently started streaming. Uh, it's called Cook in the Books. And it's basically me taking your book list that is collecting dust in the corner and reading it to you so you can say that you've read that book. I recently finished Animal Farm. Um, and then we're kind of on a hiatus. But next will be a sci-fi book. I'm trying to stick to public domain because I don't... I mm. Copyright Safe. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, but... Yeah, so you can you can find me on Thursdays at uh, 6 p.m. Mountain Time uh, most of the time. So doing that. And then, of course, on Dermy's channel, Horny Alf's channel on Sundays for gaming. And then Vets talking Thursdays and Saturdays. And I really appreciate you guys bringing me on. This is a lot oh, of fun. I are, loved it. You are <laughs> always you. welcome on this <laughs> channel, gal. You know that. Uh, Jed, what are you doing this week? Because you're not uh, in Vegas. You're like me. You're not in Vegas this week. I will not be in Vegas, unfortunately, so I'll be doing my normal channel grind for the week and uh, working on book stuff behind the scenes, which is always taking up so much of my time. I promise I'm going to start reading. I promise. And someday. Someday he'll read it. The chat might get to it. It's looking at me right here. It's looking at me right here on the screen. It sits on my desktop staring at me every day. Um, guys, you know, I'm pre-reading for Jed. That's all you need to know. Um, I'm pre-reading Jed. Um, and he's going to hate it. I'm going to hate it. <laughs> <laughs> on principle because he hate everything so I love <laughs> <laughs> anyway alright so check it out links to school as for myself uh, you guys you know who I am you're here whether you're on Jess channel or mine uh, thank you all for here chat we love you we appreciate you hit that like button subscribe to everybody's links, links in the description below where they're watching now live or on the re-upload and until oh wait Jed, do we have a movie next week uh, we do have a movie oh, for we, next see, week I almost forgot what do we got <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what do you got for us so we've often gone into the movies from Adam's childhood, you know, like um, some Charlie Chaplin. We've oh, gone oh, um, to the uh, to the moon or to the earth and the moon or whatever that one was, you know, just some Adam oldies. Yes. Yeah, I mean, he, he already had hey. great seven brides for seven brothers, I guess. Is oh, that that's a great movie. <laughs> a I movie. love I that movie. movie. Well, listen, but, I'm not in a musical right. mood, but we will get there. Okay, it's right. There. But, it's right there. To seven so, brides for seven brothers. Yeah, I have it right this right there. Yeah, nice. Right there. It could not be made today. And we say that about nope. a lot of things, but that one especially. On talent, on, on talent alone. Um, not, let's not forget the fact that they kidnap all the ladies. Yeah, uh, that, on that's talent the part alone. I was referring to. Yeah. I but, recently found that I have a physical copy of it on DVD. I was shocked. Nice. I had oh, no idea. Well, yeah. yeah, I think that means you have to join us when we watch it. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Twist my arm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so I decided to break the mold and not do something from Adam's childhood and do one from my childhood, even though it is so recent that it's barely in our okay age range or uh, <laughs> date range. Okay. Uh, uh, we will be watching the Nicolas Cage 
classic Jerry Brockheimer Disney film, National Treasure. Oh, I'm behind that. I get behind it's that. A, I love that movie so I much. Behind, I love I both of them. them. Yes. I don't, yeah. I think I've only seen the second one halfway through. I don't think I've ever finished mm. the second one. It's not as good, but it's still good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, right, I hey, wish hey. we were getting a right. third one, but uh, Nicholas Cage's quotes about the third one recently yeah. make it all worth it that we're not getting it. All right. Yes, so absolutely. National Treasure next week, and I already hinted at it, so I'll tell you because it, it, May is coming up. We'll be taking a short break first week of May because Jed won't be here, but when we come back, being that it's May and we did it last year, we got we to go, so go around because also – Actual Star Wars Day does fall on a Saturday this year. May She's probably is glad I'm going to be gone so we don't have to do it on May the 4th. Yeah, so we're <laughs> not doing it. Before. We are not doing on a fake Star Wars Day. Uh, when Jed gets back in May, we will be doing the prequel trilogy, ending with Revenge of the Sith on actual Star Wars Day, which will be followed up by my Star Wars Day, my annual Star Wars Day stream. So it's going to be a busy day. Anyway, guys, uh, so Nash Children next week. And thank you, Gal, for being here yeah, as always. Thank you. And Great. thank you again to the chat. We appreciate you guys. Everything you do keeps us going. All right, guys, take it easy. I can't speak. I'm hungry. <laughs> Bye.